Under the cover of night, their way lit only by the faint light of the moon, a group of young men snuck up to a small homestead. The little farm belongs to a bishop who is good-hearted and very trusting of people. They heard that he never locks his stables and storehouses, so the boys are convinced that their plan would go smoothly. Their intention is to break into the sheepfold under the darkness of night, steal some of the bishop's sheep, and escape before anybody notices them. But, as they attempt to cut the fence to make an opening for themselves, suddenly, an invisible force binds them in place. They are terrified. They cannot move even a muscle. The thieves are caught in their evil act, by some otherworldly power and rendered paralyzed. They remain bound in this way all night until daybreak, when finally the bishop emerges from his home, coming to take his sheep out to pasture. When the old man sees the strange sight, he approaches the frightened and exhausted youths and questions them. Ashamed, they confess with tears what had occurred. Immediately, the invisible bonds are released as they look at each other and the bishop in amazement. The holy shepherd and bishop Spiridon takes pity on them and lovingly says, Take one of the rams for yourselves, lads, so that you will not have come for nothing. But you would have done better if you were to get it by mere request rather than theft. Spiridon's gentle, simple, and loving words shocked the young men to their core, and they departed with hearts heavy from deep shame, bringing along the ram the holy elder had gifted them. This invaluable lesson stayed with them for the rest of their lives, and they never again resorted to thievery. Saint Spiridon of Thirimithus the Wonderworker was born to a Christian family of shepherds on the island of Cyprus around the year 270 AD, in the village of Askia during the reign of Emperor Aurelian, a persecutor of Christians. This period was a tumultuous one in pagan Roman history, while Christianity was still outlawed. These, however, would be the last few decades of the pagan persecutions before Christianity was finally set free and proceeded to become the most favored religion in the Roman Empire. Spiridon grew up herding sheep and continued to do so for the rest of his life. When he came of age, he was married and had children. Spiridon's wife died early in their marriage, and he was left to raise his children on his own. He became known for his mercy, charity, and deep faith in God, which was manifested in his great love for all people. Despite his humble status, he eagerly gave what little he had to those in need and showed great mercy to the suffering. He worked tirelessly to provide for his children and anyone who came to him for help. He did not have any formal education, and his heart was simple, much like that of the humble shepherds to whom the angels appeared on the night the Lord was born. He became an example to all, not in words alone, but also in deeds thus silently proclaiming the gospel of Christ to the people of Cyprus throughout his life. 
The people's love for this simple shepherd did not escape the attention of the church's hierarchy, who realized that Spiridon had great spiritual depth and wisdom. So, despite the lack of formal education, they decided to appoint him as Bishop of Trimithus, making him a shepherd of the rational sheep of Christ as well. Even after being appointed a bishop, Spiridon continued to live a simple, hard-working life. He continued to take care of his sheep and land, alongside caring for his rational flock. One year, Cyprus was experiencing a terrible drought. Though the island is no stranger to droughts, this one was exceedingly bad. The hungry people came to the saint and complained that many of the wealthy who had already stored much grain from past harvests were not sharing their stocks with the rest of the people. Instead of using words to chastise the rich and shame them for their actions, the humble bishop turned everything over to the Lord. He began to pray day and night for rain to come to the thirsty land and comfort the people. Soon, heavy clouds began to form, and water gushed forth from the skies. There was so much rain that the doors of the storehouses burst open, and the starving people were fed, as the owners could not control the grain. Due to the rain, the fields again became fertile, and the rich were put to shame by the miracle of God. The people's faith was strengthened, and word about the miracle-working saint spread throughout the island and beyond. Through St. Spiridon's prayers and loving actions, God often corrected those who had strayed from the right path. Many of the stories of these events have been kept in the memory of the people of Cyprus through the centuries and are still being recounted even until our days. Once, the saint sold a hundred sheep to a man, who, knowing that Spiridon was trusting and never counted the money he received, only gave him money for ninety-nine sheep, keeping the price of the one animal for himself. As the dishonest man started to leave with the hundred sheep, one of the sheep refused to follow, but returned to St. Spiridon. The saint drove this sheep away, but it kept returning, refusing to follow her new owner. The man came back to retrieve the stray animal, and St. Spiridon approached him and whispered in his ear, Observe, my son, this animal is not doing this in vain. Did you perhaps withhold her price? Hearing this, the man was deeply ashamed, and immediately paid the remaining sum for the sheep. As soon as he did, the animal instantly followed him and joined the rest of the herd. On another occasion, a poor man who was in great debt came to the saint while he was tending his sheep in the fields and asked for financial help. The saint pointed to a snake passing by and said to the man, Pick it up. The snake immediately turned to gold. St. Spiridon instructed the man to take the golden snake and bring it to the lenders as a collateral for the loan until he is able to pay it back. A few months went by, and the man was able to pay back the loan. So he brought the golden snake back. St. Spiridon said to him, Put it back where you found it. The man placed the golden snake on the ground, and immediately the snake came alive again and rushed away to safety. One afternoon, St. Spiridon went to church with only a chanter and a deacon. He lit the oil lamps and candles and started the Vesper service. As the saint proclaimed, Peace be unto all, before the chanter could respond, a great multitude of heavenly voices sung in unity, 
and with thy spirit. The otherworldly choir continued to chant throughout the service. As the villagers were returning from their fields, they heard the beautiful melodies coming from the church. Curious, they approached and looked through the windows to see who were these people in the amazing choir chanting in such a magnificent way. They never heard anything like that in their village before. But all they saw was an empty church, except for their beloved bishop and the two helpers. The villagers, astonished, glorified God, realizing that those were angelic voices accompanying their bishop in prayer. This convinced them even more of the holiness of their beloved hierarch. Saint Spiridon despised worldly fame and human honor. Everything he did was for the glory of God and not his own benefit. But God, who is infinite wisdom, wanted to glorify Spiridon even during his earthly life for the spiritual benefit of many. In 313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, with the Edict of Milan, freed Christianity from persecution once and for all. He then proceeded to support this newfound way of life with the guidance of his holy mother Helen. As he learned more about its fundamental principles, he saw the possibility of transforming the Roman Empire to an ideal society, where people could live in peace with each other according to the teachings of Christ. He saw in the unity of the Christian Church a possibility for establishing unity and peace for the Empire, the Pax Romana, in a way never experienced before. But in Alexandria, a philosopher-priest named Arius, whose mind was ruled by human logic, was teaching a new idea that would become one of the most severe controversies in early church history. Arius believed that there was a time when the Son was not, thereby making Jesus Christ a creation of the Father and less than Him. He spoke of Christ as Ipsilos Anthropos, or a kind of superhuman, who was not God, but a creation of God. This theological distortion began to take root in the minds of many lay Christians, and even some of the bishops. Fierce debates among the lay people, clergy, and bishops began to rage throughout the major cities of the Roman Empire. Inevitably, Emperor Constantine took notice. Division in the church implied division in the empire, and Constantine could not have it. So, he decided to settle the issue by bringing together in a synod all the bishops of the church to debate the issue and make a final decision on it. He invited every bishop from around the empire to attend. He provided free transportation through the imperial mail system of chariots. The council was to be held in the city of Nicaea, in Asia Minor, not far from the new capital he founded, the New Rome, which was later called Constantinople. The holy bishop of Trimithus received the invitation of the emperor as well, and decided to attend the first ecumenical council in Nicaea. Bishop Spiridon, at the age of about 55, started his journey with a small group of companions. They headed toward Salamis, on the eastern coast of Cyprus, to find a ship that would take them to Nicaea. In the evening, tired from the day's journey, the group decided to spend the night in an inn, planning to continue on their way in the morning. But, the followers of Arius, hearing that the miracle-working bishop was to attend the council, became exceedingly worried lest the spirit-filled Spiridon, with his wisdom, significantly influence the Synod's decision. Therefore, some of them decided to disrupt his journey. 
according to the local tradition. That night, as Saint Spiridon and his companions were resting, the Arians snuck into the inn's stables and decapitated the two horses that pulled his carriage. Early in the morning, a servant discovered the mutilated animals. Surprised and horrified at what he saw, he ran quickly to tell Saint Spiridon what had happened. To the surprise of his companions, the bishop did not seem phased at all. He calmly asked the servant to come with him to the stables. When they arrived, he ordered him to help him put the heads of the horses back on their bodies. The servant rushed to obey him, and in his haste, as the stables were still dark, he accidentally put the head of the white horse on the body of the black horse and the head of the black on the body of the white. The horses, however, immediately came back to life and rose to their feet. Seeing this miracle, the people of that place, a village now called Gaiduras, glorified God for the power given to the saint and for the disruption of the wicked plan of the heretics. Saint Spiridon continued his journey with his companions and safely arrived at his destination. At Nicaea, the simple yet wise Spiridon found himself amongst that era's most educated and brilliant Christian minds. He must have stood out in his simple, poor clothes and humble appearance. Some might have even wondered what this peasant priest was doing here. But Spiridon's heart was at peace. He knew Christ and his power and was willing to confess what he knew. At that time, many of the educated people's way of thinking was affected by the pagan Hellenic spirit and were driven by philosophical rationality. This group unfortunately, included also Christian bishops and priests who had been influenced by Neoplatonic philosophy. The underlying reason for the conflict at hand, as raised by Arius, was indeed the clash between rational philosophical thinking and the living experience of the triune God, as encountered in Christian worship. Most of the fathers present at the Synod, however, were well-read in philosophy and the Hellenic intellectual tradition and were able to freely debate with the Arians. But the sheepherder Spiridon was simple and uneducated. His faith came from experience, the presence of God in his own life, the power of God as he manifested himself in so many events. Spiridon's wisdom did not come from books, but directly from the wisdom himself, the Logos, the Sophia of God. One of the supporters of Arius, a bishop philosopher highly skilled in the art of rhetoric, stood up and presented his arguments against the idea that the Holy Trinity consists of three persons in one essence. His arguments were philosophically powerful, convincing, and difficult to counter. The room remained silent. Everyone was trying to figure out how to respond to this brilliant man. Suddenly, Saint Spiridon, from the back of the room, requested to address this man himself. The other hierarchs were hesitant. For they knew Spiridon was a simple man. He had no philosophical learning and would be unable to counter this philosopher. Even his own young deacon, who had traveled with him from Cyprus, held on firmly to his garment, whispering in his ear, Elder, he will demolish you, please sit down. But the holy bishop, knowing that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, and trusting that the Holy Spirit will guide his words, pulled away from his deacon's grasp 
walked down to the front of the room, stood in front of the philosopher and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, listen to me and hear what I have to say to you. Seeing Spiridon's simple appearance, the philosopher bishop confidently and arrogantly replied, Go ahead, I'm listening. The saint spoke with a firm and resolute voice. God, who created heaven and earth, is one. He fashioned man from the earth and created everything that exists, both visible and invisible, by his word and through his spirit. That word, we affirm, is our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, true God, who showed mercy on us who had gone astray. Born of the Virgin, he lived among men, suffered the passion and the cross, died for our salvation, and arose from the dead on the third day, raising the human race together with himself. He ascended to heaven and now we await his coming again to judge us all with righteousness and reward each according to his faith. We believe that he is consubstantial with the Father, dwelling together with him and equally honored. We believe all these things without having to examine how they came to be, nor should you be so brazen as to question them. For these matters exceed the comprehension of man and far surpass all human knowledge. He then continued, Can't you now realize how true all of this is, O philosopher? You have been saying that it is impossible for three to be one, yet even in the material things we observe in the world this can be so. And reaching into his pocket, he pulled out a large piece of terracotta roof tile, which he had brought with him from Cyprus, lifted it up, and squeezing it in the palm of his hand, he proclaimed, In the name of the Father, and flames of fire went up from the tile, and of the Son, and water ran down from his palm to the ground, and of the Holy Spirit, and opening his palm, he showed the clay remaining from the tile. Everyone stood in amazement. The rationalistic philosopher was left speechless. He along with Arius and their followers were shamed. The fathers of the council asked them to repent of their ideology. Those who refused to recant were banned from the church. The fathers of the council then proceeded to put together the famous Nicene Creed, which was further expanded in 381 AD by the Second Ecumenical Council to become the Nicene-Constantinopolitan Creed. This is the Creed of Faith, which all Christians everywhere recited for the next several centuries until it was changed by the papacy. Orthodox Christians continue to recite it unchanged until today in every liturgy. While Arianism still lingered for a few decades after the Council and caused much trouble to the Church, it was ultimately extinguished by the teaching and resilience of the Holy Fathers of the 4th century, who continued to follow the decisions of the Council of Nicaea. When St. Spiridon returned to Trimithus, terrible news reached him immediately. His daughter had passed away while he was at Nicaea. Her name was Irene, and she had lived a holy life as a virgin. Spiridon was deeply saddened by this news, but was comforted knowing that his daughter's soul was in the arms of Christ. Soon, however, a friend of Irene's came to reclaim a precious necklace she had entrusted with her. Irene had hidden the necklace somewhere that only she knew, 
not long before passing away. Now, the woman wanted the object returned, but no one knew where Irene had hidden it. Spiridon searched their entire house, hoping to find the missing necklace, but to no avail. The woman became very distraught. Realizing the situation was severe, Saint Spiridon rushed to Irene's grave and called out to her, Daughter, where is your friend's necklace? She is very distraught. His daughter immediately spoke to him from the grave and explained where she had buried the treasure. Spiridon immediately went back, found the precious item and returned it to the distraught woman. Even though by now Saint Spiridon was known throughout the Orthodox world as a great wonder worker, the humble bishop continued to live a modest and simple life, caring for his animals, working the land, helping people, and serving as an example of humility and faith to the people of Cyprus. But as the years went by, the time for him to depart from this world drew near and the aged bishop sensed it. One day, as he came out to his fields with some of the villagers to harvest his crops, a strange event took place. Even though it was a clear summer day, suddenly a rain cloud appeared above them, but drops of cooling rain only fell on Saint Spiridon's head and not on anyone else. He immediately prophesied to the amazed and perplexed people that this was a sign that he would soon repose. And so it was. In the year 348 AD, Saint Spiridon peacefully surrendered his soul to the Lord, surrounded by his beloved parishioners. The people of Trimithus were orphaned, for they lost a great spiritual father who cared for their every need for so many years. But they were soon amazed and also comforted when they realized that the body of the Blessed Spiridon showed no signs of corruption, and many miracles began to occur to those who came to him asking for intercessions. The people of Cyprus kept coming to him for help even after his death, just as they did during his earthly life, and the saint never abandoned them in their suffering. His holy relics would remain in Cyprus until the end of the 7th century, when the Arabs began raiding and ravaging the island. That's when Emperor Justinian II decided to have the holy relics of the famous saint securely transferred to the empire's capital, Constantinople. There, his incorrupt body remained safe until the city was besieged in May of 1453 by the Ottoman Turks. Then, a monk priest fearing that the ultimate catastrophe might become reality, he loaded the casket of Saint Spiridon, along with the casket of Saint Theodora on a cart, covered them with hay, brought them out of the city undetected by the Turks, and headed west. In 1456, the holy relics of the two saints would finally reach the island of Kerkira, or Corfu, and there they remain until this day. The holy relics of Saint Spiridon have been since credited with countless miracles occurring throughout the centuries, continuing even into modern times. The people of Kerkira consider Saint Spiridon as their great protector, for the saint saved the island four times from great calamity. Four grand processions are organized annually in the city of Kerkira to remember and celebrate these miracles of the saint. Two of the processions are in remembrance of the island's deliverance from plagues in 1630 and 1673. The third is held in commemoration of the deliverance of the island from a terrible famine in 1553, and the fourth in celebration and gratitude to the saint for the protection and deliverance of the island from the Turkish invasion 
of 1716. In all four occasions after the Divine Liturgy, thousands of people process through the city, led by the bishops and other clergy, carrying the incorrupt, miraculous relics of St. Spiridon. In Cyprus, the island of his birth, despite the absence of his relics since the 7th century, St. Spiridon continued to be honored, especially in the town of Tremetusia, ancient Trimithus. Many miracles would take place at his original tomb, around which a monastery had been built. But, in July of 1974, Turkey invaded the island of Cyprus. And by the end of that August, St. Spiridon's monastery and tomb were included in a Turkish military installation. No one has had access to it since then, and its condition remains unknown to this day. St. Spiridon's feast day is celebrated every year on December 12th. On that day, Thousands of faithful flock to Kerkira to venerate his miraculous relics. There, many find healing, consolation, and deliverance from all kinds of sufferings through the intercessions of this spiritual giant. Saint Spiridon is truly a shining star among the saints of our church. This simple, humble, and uneducated man of God is greatly revered throughout the Orthodox world from Cyprus to the Levant to the Balkans, and even in far-off Russia and beyond. Saint Spiridon is a ceaseless intercessor for us before the throne of the Triune God, whom he fiercely defended at the Great Council of Nicaea. Saint Spiridon, Champion of Orthodoxy, pray for us.